Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may be seated. New Year's Eve is all about time, counting time, thinking about time, the time that has passed, the time that is yet to come, the time that it's present. As believers in God and his word, there is something that is significant and meaningful in all of this thinking about time that merits this gathering together on New Year's Eve in God's house for us to think about, talk about together. One of the many things that separates the believer from the unbeliever is the way that we think about time, namely the time that we are given to live in this world. As believers, we understand that the time that we are given to live in this world is a gift. That is, it is given to us by God. And therefore, it is not ours to use as we please. It is given as a gift, and we are to return that gift by using the time that we have been given in ways that please God. Then there is also the straightforward acceptance among believers, even the anticipation that God has numbered the days that he has given to us. And there is a time that he will, that he has appointed for us when the days that he has given us will come to their end and we will die, which is for each one individually a time when time stops. And then lastly, there is this thought about time in which we acknowledge that God has set from the beginning, from when there was no time, for the Son of God to be called into this world and to come again on what is called the last day which doesn't mean the end of existence, but the end of time for everyone, believer and unbeliever, and which for believers means that there is no more counting our days or numbering them because there is only one eternal day that never ends. There is a beautiful prayer in our hymnal, in the order of Compline, that combines all three of these ways in which the believer thinks about time. And in my opinion, it may be one of the most sublime prayers in the hymnal. It goes like this. Abide with us, Lord, at the end of the day, at the end of our life, at the end of the world. Abide with us with your grace and goodness, with your holy word and sacrament, with your strength and blessing. Abide with us when the night of affliction and temptation comes upon us, the night of fear and despair, the night when death draws near. Abide with us and with all the faithful now and forever. Amen. The text for our consideration this evening is the epistle reading that we heard from Galatians 4, in which we hear St. Paul introduce us to God's extraordinary use of time. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. In addition to this word from St. Paul, I would also like to include a word from David from Psalm 31, verses 14 and 15. David writes, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Any biblical thinking and talking about time always begins in the beginning, 
when God created time. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And so it goes clear through the sixth day. But when we get to the seventh day, the day called the Sabbath day, we read, God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. What we do not read is anything about, and there was evening, and there was morning, as we did in days one through six. When we get to the seventh day, in the beginning, there is just one eternal, holy day with no beginning, no end, in which there is perfect rest. This is the way that it was in the beginning. And if it had not been for sin, this is the way it would still be today, which would mean the same as it was in the beginning day. But when sin enters into this world, the worst thing that could possibly happen is for there to be no end to the day in which there is only darkness and no rest. And so time has marched on, as we like to say, which does not mean end of story. All throughout the course of history, God has been working all things according to his good and holy purpose, which is to bring his whole creation back to the true eternal seventh day again. This ordering of time and history by God is focused on the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. What Paul identifies as the fullness of time, when God sent forth his son, born of a woman, is amplified when God's son, born of a woman, and under the law, in time, proclaims for all to hear, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And then this fullness of time is narrowed down to a specific hour as the Son announces that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This hour in the fullness of time actually lasts six hours. And the final hour, as it ticks down to its final minutes, and the divine will and purpose of God is about to be accomplished once for all. This child of Mary, this son of God, cries out from the cross, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that he may glorify you. From the Christian perspective, all time ever since the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ is counted as the end times. The clock is now ticking down to the final day, the Sabbath day, the seventh day, or what we typically call the last day. On the last day, the Lord Jesus will descend from heaven just as he ascended into heaven, and the great separation will take place. And the darkness of night will be gone forever. And the light of day will be all in all. And of that day, there will be no end. No more past. No more future. Only today. Only the dwelling of man in the Sabbath rest of God that has no end. Can we even begin to imagine it? And if we can't imagine it, we are here tonight to at least, 
at least think about. How, as Moses instructs us, we should learn to number our days aright. How shall we live as we come to the end of another year of time and as we are about to begin a new year of time in the year of our Lord, 2024? It seems to me that the sons and the daughters of God are free to live with a sense of confidence that this world does not have and that it cannot give, irrespective of all of the promises that it makes. We know that the fullness of time has come. God has ordered all things according to his purpose, and he continues to do so. As much as the modern soothsayers might claim to know the future, no one really does. We don't know what's going to happen an hour or five minutes from now, let alone tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. But for the believer, for the believer who knows that our loving God is both the creator of time as well as the redeemer of time, as well as the controller of time, that is enough. It's enough for us to simply believe that God is directing every hour, every minute, every second, according to his holy purpose, which he has already accomplished in his son, both for our life now and for our eternal life to come, which frees the faithful child of God to live faithfully in the time that we have been given and to let God do, as Luther says, all of the worrying about how things are going to turn out. How does Solomon put it in his famous song? For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear, tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. In every one of these times, some pleasant some unpleasant, some downright heartbreaking, some torturous. We live in the confidence that the fullness of time has come and that we have been redeemed and that we belong to God. In every season and every time, we let the word of God, the word of God's Son, ring loudly in our ears. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Which, when you think about it, gives fuller meaning to what Jesus told his believers when he said, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. For the believer, There is no reason to be anxious about tomorrow. We already know the outcome of our faith. What we don't know is how all of the minutes and the hours and the days and the years fit together to bring us to that end. Only God knows that. 
Only God has the panoramic view. Only he sees the beginning, the middle, and the end all at once in minute detail, just as he saw it in the beginning before he created it. So this principle that God is in control of time and has ordered all time to accomplish his holy purpose applies not only to the world, but even more importantly, to each and every individual in the world. We sometimes wonder how much time do I have to live? And the answer is, only God knows, but God surely knows. Job confesses the biblical faith, saying, man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of months and have set limits he cannot exceed. David declares, all of the days ordained for me were written in your book before any of them came to be. What this means for the child of God, who strives to live by faith in the fullness of time, is that we are free to live in the present and let God take care of the future. The future is God's to worry about, not ours. And so the most important time for the believer is today. Today, he says, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. Sometimes, We call this approach to time as living in the moment. To live in the moment, that is, to give our undivided attention to the present moment, is frankly not something that I am very good at. And maybe you're a bit like me. In the moment, I often worry about the future or fret about the past. I can be speaking with someone whom the Lord has put right in front of me. And in that moment, my mind will drift to something else, even while we are still speaking. And sure enough, as I am doing my best to concentrate on being in the moment, my phone will signal that a text has just come in or a new picture has been posted, and I am no longer in the moment which the Lord has put right in front of me. I've been listening to an album of music called Sanctuary Songs, which if you're not familiar with it, you might take a look at it or listen to it. It's actually quite good. The opening song in the album is one that I've been listening to repeatedly because I want to learn the principle that it outlines for myself. It's called, I want to be where my feet are. I'm not going to sing it. We're going to leave that for Pastor Laguten when he gets back from vacation. But the words to the song go like this. I want to be where my feet are. I want to breathe the life around me. I want to listen as my heart beats right on time. I want to be where my feet are. I chase my worries. I flee my sorrows. But what you give me is now. So take my burdens and my tomorrows. I want to be where my feet are. Trusting in the Lord to use even all of our sins and shames of the past for his good purpose, directing all of the future towards the same, allows us to focus on the present, which is right where our feet are. I'll close with this. In 1998, 
I had the wonderful experience of visiting the Holy Lands with a tour group. We toured the region of Judea and the region of Galilee with a guide. One of the stops in Galilee was at a church called the Church of the Seven Apostles. And it sat right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was an Eastern Orthodox church and it had been dedicated centuries before to the seven apostles who were recruited by Jesus who came from the region of Galilee. After an introduction to the building from the resident monk, we were free to wander around this beautiful building with all of its remarkable paintings and icons and stained glass. As I approached the chancel, I noticed that on the wall to the left of the altar behind the pulpit, a series of racks on the wall that were all filled to fullness with wristwatches. There was no way possible to count them all. There had to be thousands of watches in all shapes and sizes hanging on the wall from hooks. Curious as to what this was all about, I went to find the monk in charge and asked the meaning of the watches. And he explained that along with the recruitment of the seven apostles from the area in which this church was located, the region of Galilee and the town of Capernaum in particular was where Jesus healed many people of their diseases. It was in Capernaum that Matthew tells us that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law and that great crowds gathered and were lined up outside the door and Jesus healed them all. Based on this, the monk told me that the tradition developed over time in which people with terminal illnesses and diseases came to this church and kneeling at the railing of the chancel, they prayed. And after praying, they take off their watch, hand it to the monk in charge who hangs it on the rack which is to say, they give their time to the Lord, saying with David, I trust you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. We do not know what lies ahead for us in 2024. We do know, however, that the Lord does know. And of this we may be sure. The coming year is going to go exactly according to the holy will and gracious purpose of the God who loves us and has made us his own. And for us, that's enough. It's all that we need. We are free to pray. Lord, I trust you. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Let me be where my feet are.